1 John 1, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Romans 8. Thirty-five, thirty-seven through thirty-nine. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? But in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. First Corinthians fifteen fifty one through fifty eight. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then we will come about, then will come about the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this final verse, which was for all of us who have touched the life of George William Buchan, the family relatives, friends, those who had him, held him in the nursery 15 years ago, Sunday school teachers, Awana, pastors Carl and John. Therefore, my beloved brethren, all of us in this family who believe and touched George William Buchan, be steadfast, immovable, May I add, don't quit, don't give up, don't surrender. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. George William, <laughs> we love you, and we know that we will see you again. I have been asked to read uh, some things that George's grandmother and I wrote. And this is what Granny April remembered quickly. I have been blessed with many additions to our family. George arrived on Christmas Eve 2001. He was a sweet baby. Yes, I am prejudiced. As he grew, I've known he would be an intensely focused individual. For instance, I remember visiting with them when George was about one and a half years old, and he lined up perfectly his matchbox cars on the counter, and then smiled big. His sense of preciseness was satisfied. About a year ago, he and Ian were excited to build their own robot with parts from Grampy 
and help from Grandpa, working a little at a time over several months to complete it. Grampy and I loved that he would call his engineering Grampy to both receive and give tips on projects he was doing or video games they liked playing. George was always so helpful when we were together. He was my right-hand man, helping me with his siblings and with anything I asked his help with. He even knew how to get my phone to work. He obviously enjoyed being able to help others with his expertise. He was quiet, reserved, full of promise, and we loved him. I wrote most of this last Friday afternoon, right after Charity had called me with the news. I received terrible news today. My daughter, the mother of a remarkable family of six children who are mostly well-behaved, usually good-natured, amazingly obedient a lot of the time, and filled with potential, called to tell me that her oldest son had committed suicide this morning. He was a very bright young man of 15. He was keen on pursuing his interests in many areas and determined to succeed in those things that he found important. He was a very capable student with high expectations for his own performance in challenging subjects. He expected to do well. He was often thoughtful, sometimes solemn, frequently intense, occasionally very impatient, but usually a person of remarkable patience and diligence. He accepted the burden of being the firstborn in a large family and nearly always discharged his responsibilities with honor. He was well-spoken, able to present ideas understandably, recognizing that he was brighter and more knowledgeable than many of those around him. Whenever possible, he preferred to trust his own judgment and to be responsible for himself. Certainly, my grandson was growing up to be an admirable young man, and I admired him, as did many others. My daughter and her husband and family are much involved in a sound Bible-teaching local Christian church. They are faithful in attendance and personally committed people of faith. And my grandson was raised from birth in the reality of an infinite creator God who deserves our worship, a loving Savior who sacrificed more than we can understand to save those who come to him by faith. Years earlier, my grandson came to him by faith and was saved for all eternity. Why would such a one take his own life? We do not know. Nobody that's left behind can know for certain. There are things, however, that we can know. We know that he loved his family and they loved him. We know that he worked hard to understand how things worked and that it was important to him that things worked as well as they could. He wasn't afraid to share his understanding. My grandson was very strong-willed, like most firstborns, and had learned to deal with many issues by internalizing them. He didn't say everything he thought, and was willing to wait to deal with things in the hope that he could find a way to make them work out as he thought they should. He had good evidence that he could trust his own judgment on many issues. He made a simple mistake with fatal consequences. His mistake was that he thought his judgment was valid in matters concerning himself. Having made this mistake, he assessed whatever situation he was in last Friday whatever it was, and judged a response that he felt was necessary to resolve that situation. It crushed our hearts. Though it was not God's will 
for George's life to be cut off at the age of 15, the Lord was fully aware of what George's action would be long before he was born. As soon as George came to him by faith, he welcomed George into his family with joy. While we grieve, we grieve not as others who have no hope. And George fully understands now. We were blessed to have him with us for 15 years. He will continue to be ours to hold in our hearts always. <clears throat> I have the honor to read what Charity, George's mother, has written to share with you all. I prayed for him for so long so fervently. After two miscarriages, I cried out to God every day for my pregnancy with George, that he would live, that we could hold him in our arms and love him forever. And God answered our prayers beautifully and perfectly. George was born on Christmas Eve, wide-eyed with curiosity as he entered the world. He kept his eyes wide open throughout his childhood soaking up all he could about the world he lived in. He loved to know exactly why things worked the way they did and soaked up every bit of information he could absorb. So we learned about magnets. We learned about the kings of Israel. We learned about gravity and solar systems, World War II airplanes, and how to diagram gerund phrases. He loved the precise, dependable world of physics and technology, but reveled in the fantastic, the imaginary, the impossible. He read H.G. Wells and C.S. Lewis and Bradbury, P.J. Hodehouse and Douglas Adams. We explored water tension and thermodynamics and level eight of Super Mario Brothers. We watched Cleasy, Cheesy, classic Doctor Who, and read Spider-Man comics. He beat me at Scrabble at third grade. He resented that I didn't tell him about the negative numbers sooner. <laughs> he had to have his blanket and stuffed animal just right before he could go to sleep at night. He always had adult-sized curiosity emotions inside a child's mind and body. <clears throat> George loved to be with his father. <clears throat> or his uncles, or his cousins, or his grandfathers. He loved to play games with them and eat pizza. He loved to memorize scripture and tried so hard to get things right, and he did. I was fiercely proud of him every day of his life. <clears throat> he made Lego stop motion animation videos and wrote computer code and designed his own intricate board games. He was brilliant and shy and loved music, but he hated singing. When he was 14, he worked for the summer at Campo Kills in Minnesota and was very proud of his time there. He loved the legend of Zelda and every incarnation he played. He loved the snow, roller coasters, computer games. He loved Joe Froggers, Swedish fish, and Rocky Road ice cream. He loved to make a sandwich in a precise order of ingredients and then eat them slowly while reading a sci-fi book or listening to a retro gaming podcast or watching The Twilight Zone. He could tell you the history of every video game company and system ever made. He was going to own an arcade filled with vintage games and the newest gaming systems. He was going to be a computer programmer and software engineer and write an app that would make a million dollars and then wisely not spend most of it. I believe God builds families 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly how they need to be put together. We all needed George's hunger for knowledge, his love for punny humor, and his ex expertise in so many things. He was a brother to look up to. Our son to marvel at, a friend we could count on. George needed all of us too. He needed Ian's unpredictable, silly humor and tender heart. He needed Grace's brave and tenacious character. He needed Claire's sweet love of stuffed animals. And he shared, they shared their dark humor. George needed Lucy's adoration, Lincoln's wildness. We all loved him so much in our own ways. And he loved us too in his own way, the best that he could. I know how greatly we needed him. And even though I don't know exactly, <clears throat> exactly how, I know God can fill that need now in all of our lives. The love we have had for George and have for George has nowhere to go now, but God is love. He can take that emptiness, fill it with his loving kindness, if we will let him.
I just want to tell you what a beautiful picture this is. And not just because there will never be this many t-shirts worn in this room ever again. <laughs> and just to give you my story for that part, I was a little, um, it was Charity's idea and I, I wasn't sure what to think of it at first or what, what to do. And um, went to my dresser that next morning and uh, this was the first shirt I saw. and. I had forgotten that uh, um, I had a shirt that matched the one that George was wearing when he died. And if you don't know Camp Oak Hills, or Scott mentioned it, it was the, the, the camp that uh, uh, he manages in, in Minnesota, and, and George spent many weeks there, and it was a big part of his life. And so thank you to each of you for being here. I, I confess I have imagined this moment before, but it was always for a different George. Never did I imagine I would be standing before you all to say goodbye to my son. But here we are, and I would be forever regretful if I did not stand before you and express my gratitude. So George, I remember the first moment I met you. It was a special time and you, you made us a family. That first night we sat down and I held you right here. We watched It's a Wonderful Life. You brought wonder to Charity and I's life. I thank you for that. You've touched us in so many ways. George, thanks for loving me. Thanks for showing so much interest in the things that I enjoyed. Every time we would talk about history or politics, go to a sporting event, maybe play a board game, you were doing that because you loved me. You listened when I had something to tell you. And you took seriously the teaching that you were given. George, thank you for loving your mother. Your mama loved you so much. You were, and, and your brothers and sisters were everything to her. And they always will be. So thank you for loving and respecting her. Thank you for taking the interest in the things that she loved too. George, you were the, you were the only big brother Ian will ever have. Thanks for being right by his side every day of his life for sharing and the fun for sharing everything that you had with him even when you didn't want to <laughs> he's going to need your memory very close George thank you for loving your sisters Grace looked up to you and she admired you and she was so thankful for you. And Claire did too. They relied on you as a leader amongst the brothers and sisters. George, thanks for caring for Lucy and Lincoln. They'll never know what they missed not having you around. 
but the time that they had was precious. George, I could go on about all of our other family members, but in big and small ways, you touched all of them. We're all so thankful. Most of all, George, I'm thankful that as you learned about this world, as you spent time in this church and in this place, as you studied your own Bible, you came to know the truth. And I have hope, I have full confidence that George, your belief and trust was in a savior who knew and loved you, who had paid the debt for you and George, I know that you're with him right now. George, based on, on that hope, I want to give you a couple promises today. First of all, George, I forgive you. I don't know what you were thinking. I don't know why you're gone. But I want you to know I will forever hold your memory with fondness. I will never question what has happened. George, I promise you that, that I understand that regret will only debilitate. I understand, George, that there are things if I wanted to, I wish I could change, that I wish I could have done better for you. But George, I promise I won't waste energy in that regard, but I will take your memory and your life and this loss and use it to renew my devotion and strengthen it to love those around me to be the father that your five siblings need to be the husband that your sweet mother needs. So George, based on that hope, that confidence that we have in Christ, I've known you as a son, and one day I will know you as a brother. And I know where you are now. And I can say to you, with joy in my heart, welcome home, son. I'll be with you again. For those of us who are not home yet, thank you for being a part of George's life. Thank you for loving him, for supporting our family, for teaching him. There are people all through this room that have spent time in a Sunday school class, time in a youth group, time in a nursery, Time in our home, teaching and loving George and showing him what new life in Christ is all about. You've been such a blessing to our family.
for my church family. We've walked down this road before. I had the honor of spending some time with Sam Gentry this week. And many of you know him, some of you don't. Sam and Renee, they're here with us, and it's a blessing. Lost their son over eight years ago under very similar circumstances. And I shared with Sam that at the time I I didn't know their family uh, well, but Wyatt's loss had a real effect on me. And um, I remember the Saturday morning after uh, after he had died, um, I was at work in the in the store showroom before opening and had the radio on, and a song came on that I instantly recognized as as my mind was just heavy with prayers for Sam and Renee and and thoughts of them, and the song was a song that. Sam had sung as a duet with Levi some months or years prior to that. And instantly my, in my mind I could see him with his son singing these words. And he was singing, Lord, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I dropped to my knees at that moment and I said, God, Please let Sam be able to sing those words this morning. That you, in the face of this loss, would be able to say, God, you are wonderful to me. And I never forgot that moment. And now I know that God had that specifically planned. So that when we lost George, that would come flooding back to me to give me a peace and a realization. God gave me a gift. God gave our family a gift. He's been taken away. As Pete said, not because it was God's will, but evil is in our world and will be until the coming of our King. But I can rest and know there's a promise in the Bible that everything does work out for good to those that love him. And I rest in that. And I believe God's been wonderful to our family. And I will always thank him for George. think it would end this way. End? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another part. One that we almost take. The grey rain curtain in this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. Far green country, 
to a swift sunrise. That isn't so bad.
first, I suppose I owe an apology that I don't have the George uniform. I don't have t-shirts and my blue jeans don't fit. <laughs> As we think about this dear young man, may I ask you and encourage you as family and friends to think of him in the present? It's not that George was, George is. He is. He's with the Lord. And all those things circling in his mind that we don't understand, he knows now. And his Savior is taking care of him. Nate asked me to share just a few words on the, the thought of grief. A fellow named Frank Graff, a number of years ago, back in the early 1900s, was going through some deep, deep pain. His younger sister had just died. He was in great physical pain. He was a minister who was known as Minister of Sunshine. He was normally a very positive man. But he went through this dark place and came through the other side, through the valley of the shadow. And he wrote a poem that became a hymn. And the poem is titled, Does Jesus Care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for joy and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way goes weary and long, does he care? And the refrain is, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my heart aches till it nearly breaks. Does it really matter to him? Does he see? Oh, yes. He sees, and yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know. I know my Savior cares. And this is what we affirm today, and this is what I ask you to receive as family and as friends. The absolute assurance that the Lord Jesus cares and that he knows what's going on though we don't and he knows the why though we don't and perhaps don't need to and more than that we know that he understands and this is what I want the Buchan family individually and together to receive today and all those who are together with us individually and corporately because he knows precisely and I do mean precisely how we feel and the grief that we experience. We know this because he did not stand outside of it. He entered into it fully, personally. He knows the death of a son in a way that you and I never could as he gave his son so that these days may have joy in the midst of sorrow and hope in the midst of heartache. And the unfathomable truth of the Trinity and the deity of Christ, we know that he entered into it and did something about it, God himself in flesh. And we know it because it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, both to earth and to return, Jesus the Son of God, because we know this, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in every way tested like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. And there are no words that are more clear, no, more profound than Isaiah 53. And again, these are words especially for the family, Nate, Charity, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, extended family. Listen to this. This is what he entered into, and that's why we say, and we know he understands, we know he cares specifically. It says in Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected of men, or by men, but he's described as a man of sorrows, 
and acquainted with grief, not just acquainted like we're acquainted with someone. That word means he knows it. Christ himself was predicted to be a man who understood mental anguish and sorrow and grief. He knew it. He walked through it. He knows it. But more than that, he walked through it so that this promise in verse 4 could be ours. Today, right now, today. Surely he has borne our griefs. And he's carried our sorrows. That's what he did. He went to the cross, he died, he paid for sins, but he entered into all that death means, all that grief and sorrow means, and he did something about it. He did not stand outside of it. He came into it personally. That is our Savior. That is the uniqueness of the Christian faith. And because of that, then we have this promise concerning our mourning and our grief. In Isaiah 61, Christ took this when he spoke in the synagogue and he opened this scripture and he read it and then he sat down and he he said, this saying is fulfilled in your sight today. Isaiah 61 predicted several hundred years before Christ ever came. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I deeply appreciate what each one of the family members have shared, that to stand up here and affirm the reality that you know the wonder and wonderfulness of the Savior in the midst of this great difficulty. That's what he came to do. And we see it tenderly fulfilled at the tomb of Lazarus when Christ, knowing that Lazarus was going to die, he waited and he went to the tomb because he wanted to be, to give to you and to me an illustration that death is not the end. And he stood at Lazarus' tomb and he wept. He did not weep for Lazarus. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He wept for those who were weeping. He wept for the grieving. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. We see it in the garden when he groaned. And it says his grief was so deep and so heavy uh, that the capillaries in his skin broke open and he sweated blood. Because he was taking upon himself not just sin in the sense that we think of it, Christ paying for our sins so that we could go to heaven one day, but he took our sorrows, our griefs, our sin, all that this fallen world brings, and all the reasons people die, Christ was taking on himself and pleaded for it to be removed from him while he even was willing to say, not my will but thine, I will go through it so that there can be an answer to days like this. And we see it most magnificently in the cross and the resurrection. And these are the words for you again concerning grief, not just forgiveness for eternity, which we we thank God for, but when he said it is finished, that means all that was predicted in Isaiah 61. Joy for mourning, beauty for ashes, he said it's finished. So our grief and our sorrow, which is natural, it's a physical, emotional, spiritual response to loss, But these are things God has given us to cope with living in the reality of a fallen world. And his greatest gift is the grace to know that he truly, deeply, completely understands. And his goodness has not been changed by what took place this past week. It's not been changed by the deep pain that we experience. And so we trust him. We trust him with the grief. And we trust him with the questions. And we trust him. And we entrust to him, George. And we go to him to find grace, to help in this time of need. And because we do, he will give beauty for ashes and joy for mourning and praise for a spirit of heaviness. In fact, I would say that we can experience beauty while we stand in the ashes. And joy in the midst of mourning. And we can know 
and experience praise even while we have a spirit of heaviness. That's why the Apostle Paul, in his own grief and heartache, said, I'm sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. One Sunday a few months ago, I spoke on grief from Psalm 30, and that's one of the reasons Nate asked me to share this this morning. And David, in his extraordinary pain and grief, made this affirmation, the Lord has turned my joy into dancing. And I said then, and I say again today, the Lord does that in his own miraculous way. Not dancing as if the pain never happened. As if the, as if the events somehow didn't take place, some Pollyannish positive thinking or denial of reality. But dancing with a limp. Dancing, even though we know the reality of what's going on. We are pressed down, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. So may the grace and peace and sufficiency, and yes, even beauty and praise be with you. Nate, Charity, Ian, Grace, Claire, Lucy, Lincoln, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, to all of us here. May the grace and peace and sufficiency and beauty and praise of the Lord be with you all. Amen.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my Well, I just want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I, we're here to remember George William Buchan and to encourage his family in their time of loss and, and sorrow. So just on their behalf, let me allow, or allow me to thank you from them for being here today to support them. You know, sorrow and grief are never easy. Um, we would never, uh, death never comes at an opportune time. It, we always would want a little bit more, and, and even the details and the, the, the circumstances surrounding George's passing were, came at such a shock. And I know for many of us, it felt like a, a punch in the gut, and uh, it was very shocking to hear the news, and immediately our hearts go out to the family when we hear those things. And, um, but you know, as it has been mentioned, today we're, we're here in many ways to, to celebrate his life. Uh, there's some ex exciting things that happened in George's life as well. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that um, this afternoon. You know, he entered the world on Christmas Eve. Isn't that, a, isn't that an interesting day to enter the world? Uh, 2001 and to first-time parents, uh, as it were. And uh, those of you who have been parents know what it felt like to take your first one home from the hospital. I had, I almost tried to beg a nurse to come with me full time to help me out because I didn't know what I was doing. And yet George was that for Nate and Charity. You know, Charity described him in a Facebook post and I think this was just so appropriate. He's, she said, this young man was a, a brilliant character. Isn't that, just a, isn't that just a beautiful description of George, those of you that knew him? Uh, he was a kid and yet he was very mature. At the same time, he had a unique uh, quality about him in that way. Um, you know, as I was just thinking about memories that I've had with George, I've been the pastor here for a little bit over a year, and so I haven't known George and his family that long, but it's, it's interesting as I began to think about the memories, how some of them started flooding through. And uh, I remember just this past July, we had a, uh, a situation with the pool in our backyard, and, uh, and I remember Nate and George left a, a birthday party that was nearby, I think at Ross and Victoria's, and came over and, and helped us fix it. And George was there with Nate. And it's funny, those are just very generic, generic memories, but how, how precious and special they are to me. I, I, remember, um, I remember George sitting right back in the sound room back there during our vacation Bible school this past summer and going through hundreds of pictures and cutting them out and putting a slideshow together with Corey Miller. I remember, I remember the, how hard those young men were working back there. I remember that about him. Uh, as a pastor, I, I remember just how much joy it brought to me to, to hear George recount his, his trip to Camp Oak Hills. And um, you could... You could tell this young man was developing into a leader. And that just warmed my heart to hear him talk about his experience and just the way that he led while he was there and, the, and the, just the mature thinking in terms of freeing up that staff to do other things. And I just so appreciated seeing that in this young man and the way God was developing him. And, and then I've got a, a really fun memory with George that I'll, I'll treasure. I don't think I've even ever shared this with Nate and Charity, but we had George over to our house months ago, and, and he was over with my son Cody, and those of you that know James Myatt, um, the three of them were over and um, just, just having a good time, and they started a, a game out front of touch football. 
And uh, of course, they were one person short, and so they enlisted my, my oldest daughter, Abby, to play with them. And of course, uh, James and Cody were on the same team, and Abby and George were on a team. Uh, now, my daughter, Abby's a pretty good athlete, so they were keeping close, but it, those of you that know James and Cody know that they'd like to do a lot of talking. <laughs> that's, that's an understatement. If you don't know them, I'm being very sarcastic right now. They like to do a lot of talking, and there was a lot of trash flowing out of them. Well, Abby had to, to leave the game early to go do something, and so they needed a fill-in. <laughs> and you know what? I'm happy to report that day that George threw five touchdown passes, <laughs> and I caught all five of them. We took those little two to the cleaners and taught them a little humility that day. Um, but I will treasure that memory with George uh, as we kicked their butts. That was a lot of fun. But, you know, I want to shift for a moment. But uh, before I do, I, I've added something to my ensemble just for today in honor of George. And, you know, there may be some people in this room today who for the first time are thinking about eternal things. And you know what? Don't, don't push that thinking off. That's, that's an important thing. 10 out of 10 people are going to die. All of us in this room at one point are going to die. And we need to spend some time looking at the scriptures to make sure that our eternal business is in order. And what better place than where somebody, a loved one has died, has, death has this way of reprioritizing our thinking. Really... Making, making what goes on in your life just, just refocusing on what's important. And you know, this is one of those things that if you've never considered what happens after you die, or if you were to die right now and you wouldn't know for sure 100% that you'd be going to heaven, we've got good news for you today. And it's not you got to come to our church and start giving money. That's not the answer. We've got better news than that, you know, I want to talk as I lead into this, I want to talk about a decision that George made as a young man that changed his eternal destiny. You know that we talked about his birth on Christmas Eve, but you, did you know that George had a second birth? Did you know that George had a second family? That's what we want to talk about. If that sounds confusing to you today, if that's the first time you've ever heard it, you're in good company. There was a, a guy in Jesus' day named Nicodemus who was presented with that same information. And his response was, wait a minute, in order to go to heaven, I have to be born again? How do I get back into my mom's womb to, to get that figured out? And Jesus was talking totally different, about a totally different birth. In fact, you know, Nicodemus, it says in John chapter three, verses one through four, he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And that is confusing. But let's take away what he's saying there. And, and what he's saying is something that's totally contrary to religion. It's totally contrary to what you might hear at most churches. And that is this. Behavior does not get you into heaven. Birth does. The, the new birth, this birth from above that Jesus is talking about, that's the only way we can get to heaven. Because if we strictly look at behavior, the great thing about the Bible is it's honest with us. It's going to tell you specifically, it it's doesn't have YMCA thinking that everybody gets a trophy. It's actually honest with us. And the Bible is very clear that nobody is good enough on their own to get to heaven. Just being honest with you. Uh, in fact, many would raise their hand and say, yeah, I realize nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I think everybody in this room would agree with that. We understand that the Bible also confirms this. In fact, if you look at uh, even a couple of the Ten Commandments, we know that we've broken God's law. Have you ever told a lie? The Bible would call you a liar. You ever stolen anything? The Bible would call you a thief. 
The Bible says if you look with lust, you've committed adultery. The Bible says if you're angry or you hate somebody, you're a murderer. I mean, to, to be held to that high standard, nobody measures up. And yet many religions teach that the Ten Commandments were given so that you could keep them to get to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that, though. The Bible teaches clearly that the Ten Commandments were given to show us that nobody can get to heaven on their own merits. Nobody can earn heaven. And just like any human legal system, the Bible describes that there's a consequence for breaking God's law. And the Bible says that that penalty is death. The wages of sin is death. And, you know, this is a big deal because the Bible says there's no way out of this predicament on your own. This... This is why it's a big deal. There's a, there's a penalty that has to be paid and there's no way to get it out. You can't talk your way out of this penalty. You know, I remember as a teenager, I, I don't know why the Lord let this happen, but I, when I was 16 years old, I got pulled over for speeding. And guess what happened? I talked my way out of a speeding ticket. Two months later, and I'm being generous, it was probably a month later, I got pulled over for speeding again. And guess what happened? I talked my way out of a speeding ticket. I thought, What's the big deal with speeding tickets? I'll just talk my way out of them throughout the rest of my life. And it's been a rude awakening ever since then. Uh, many times says that hat doesn't always work that way. But you know, the penalty for sin is just like that. We're not going to talk our way out of that. Many people have this image that, that when we're going to see God, we'll just kind of, you know, slap him a high five and give him a handshake and we'll kind of talk our way out of this punishment. The problem is the Bible says there's no way out on your own. So the question is then, who can go to heaven? (laughs) That's a great question. Who can go to heaven? Well, the answer is is a beautiful answer. The Bible calls it the good news. Um, And here's the good news. Christ died for you. What was the penalty hanging over your head? Death. What did Jesus Christ do for you? He died for you. He died in your place. He paid the penalty for your sins so that you would never have to pay that penalty yourself. This penalty that you couldn't escape on your own, you couldn't talk your way out of, Jesus Christ came and bore that penalty head on for everyone in this room. In fact, the Bible says he did that for everyone in the world. He paid for the sins of the world. He paid that penalty that you and I deserved. Do you know that 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 tells us this, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come to save good people. He didn't come to save religious people. He didn't come to save clergy. He didn't come to save anybody but what that verse says, and that is he came to save sinners, people who had broken his law, people who have uh, committed acts of sin. That's everyone in this room. So if you're a sinner here today, you qualify for heaven, but you've got to respond to that message. That's, the Bible is clear 160 times in the New Testament alone that there's one appropriate response. There's one response that God accepts, and that is simply, do you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again? Do you believe that? Do you believe that he died in your place? Are you trusting him alone to get you to heaven? This is how one is born again. This is how George Buchan was born again that day when he heard the gospel and he put his faith in the one who died for him and rose again. And you know, that's the guarantee that we have because what we see very clearly from the Bible is because Jesus rose again and lives, George Buchan lives today. I appreciated what Pastor Carl said. We don't speak in terms of a past tense. George is living. George is living not because he was a great kid, and he was a great kid by by any stretch of the imagination, but that's not why he's living today. He's living today because at a point in time, he realized he wasn't good enough to go to heaven, and he trusted in the one who was good enough to get him there. His name is Jesus Christ. And the question for you today is, do you know George's Savior? Do Do you have your eternal business in order? You know, none of us is guaranteed the next moment. None of us is guaranteed another breath. Do you know George's Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again? I would love to visit with you more about this if you have an interest in talking more about this. In fact, 
not in order to get you to join our church or to do anything like that. I just want to know and be able to share with you how you can get to heaven. And it's, I'm just going to point you to the man who died for you and rose again, because that's what the Bible does. And so if you don't know that today, the great news about the gospel of Jesus Christ is you can get saved right where you're seated today. You don't have to walk up to this aisle. You don't have to pray a prayer. You don't have to do anything except in your seat, transfer your faith from whatever you were trusting in before to the one who died for you and rose again. Wonderful 
today my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day oh glorious day this week nate emailed me and he wrote, I feel this is the best way to conclude the service, to bring those of us left behind collectively back to the affirming truth in our beliefs, uplifting one another and rejoicing after a time of recognition of our loss and grief. He said, these three songs have been on my repeat shuffle in my head, the Holy Spirit speaking truth to my heart when it would otherwise falter. He said, go all in musically, let it rip, and give in to the joy in the message of these songs. And that's a message for all of us. Let it rip, and go into the joy in the message of these songs. Would you stand, please? Three, four. Light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that way is hard to adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together King of all days. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth, you created, So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll live
Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest grace. of your love will always be enough. world 
riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. You are my presence I may hold. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. join me in prayer. Now, Father, we pray today again, and we will continue to intercede for Nate and Charity and each of the children, for all the family, Father, the cousins and aunts and uncles, grandparents. Uh, Lord, thank you that they do not walk through this alone, that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death and you th take us through to the other end and we can be absolutely sure that your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, even in these kinds of situations. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of our faith in the finished work of Christ. He alone is worthy today and it's because of what he accomplished that we can have hope that we can have beauty for ashes and joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you for George, for his life, for the dynamic and wonderful young man that he is, even more so in your presence. Thank you for that assurance. And now, Father, may your grace and your love and the fellowship of your spirit go with us. We ask in the name of our loving Savior. Amen.